This video is going to show you I-70 from the point of the Eisenhower Tunnel as you're taking the descent down into Silverthorne. And you can see out here in the distance Loveland Ski Resort, so that's up on the left. You can see there's still snow on the mountain. This is actually the third week of May, and the chain laws, or I guess they're called traction laws, are still in effect for Colorado, and I'll talk more about those. Just want to point out, though, at, from this point, you've been coming from I-70, you've been coming from Denver. Denver is still flat, but then you come up the mountain and you're kind of making an ascent. You haven't really had anything too major except maybe Floyd Hill, and we have a video that shows you Floyd Hill. And then other than that, you've just been doing a little bit of ups and downs, mostly coming up. But at the point of Eisenhower Tunnel, when you come out of this tunnel, you're really going to be making a steep descent heading down. So this tunnel is pretty long. I would say it's maybe two to three minutes to drive through the tunnel. You can see that we are in the right lane. There's two lanes in each direction, which is really nice. If you have a big truck or an RV, you need to be in the right lane. That's the law here. And you're probably not going as fast as the people in the left side anyway. I think at this point, I'm not quite sure, the speed limit's probably 45, 50, somewhere around that, maybe 55. It's a little bit slower though, obviously, in the tunnel than it was on the main highway. The stretch goes for so long, you can't see the end of the tunnel while you're in the tunnel. And like I said, once you come out on the other side, you really can start to see what you're going to be facing in terms of the descent. I believe the clearance on this tunnel is something like 13.6 or 13.11. It's plenty tall enough for us. We like to have a clearance of 13.6. Plenty tall for us. You're seeing a lot of other semis and large um, trucks and stuff that are on this. So you don't have to worry about being too tall for this tunnel. That's not going to be an issue for you with an RV. The other thing to know is that the descent, the point that we're going westbound and you start making the descent, this is westbound by the way, this video, if you want to see what the eastbound route looks like, which is the climb up to the 12,000 foot elevation to where the tunnel is at, we have a video that shows you the ascent as well and a little bit more commentary about how we're actually driving that ascent and getting the RV to kind of push it up the mountain. This one is going to show you the descent and making sure that you kind of know some of the things about going slow enough and um, being in low gear and stuff like that. The descent though for this is about a 7% grade. So it's not the steepest grade, but the problem is, is that you're doing that 7% downhill for like six miles and then it really continues for about another five or six miles at like a six percent grade so you have a really long time period that you're heading downhill and if you're riding your brakes you're going to run into problems just a few notes look off to the left hand side some of those vehicles coming up um, you can see there's some broken down rvs you may be able to see some of the tow trucks. Honestly, those large tow trucks just hang out here waiting for people to have a, oh yeah, there was a tow truck there off to the right. They just wait for people to have a wreck or for people to have a breakdown because it is so common. They know that they can park here and they'll have some sort of business for the day. So honestly, that's how much of an issue it is for this. So you don't want to go flying through this and speeding down it. I know sometimes on my videos, people will say, wow, we can we take that faster. And I'm thinking, it's not a race. It's it's a matter of safety and making sure you're doing okay. So you can see we're going about 45 miles per hour. That's probably on the upper limit of what we want to be doing just because we are a gross weight of over 28,000 pounds. So it makes us very large, similar to these big semis pulling stuff. There's two runaway truck ramps that are off to the right hand side. And I'll point those out as we're driving by them. The If you've not been in a lot of mountains, if you've been in like the Smoky Mountains and some other hills like that, you probably don't see a lot for runaway truck ramps, but they're more prevalent out here. And the fact that there's two on this like 10 mile stretch should really indicate that this is a bad issue for problems. Now, these big trucks, like the one right in front of us here, he's probably going like 20, 25 miles per hour. And they need to because they are carrying so much weight, they will lose control if they don't stay in the really low gear. So the biggest issue for us sometimes is having a truck like that be in front of you on the right lane and then trying to be able to get around him. Um, we kind of had enough of an opening. It's a clear enough day, so we were able to get around him. We're going to be coming up here to the first runaway truck ramp. I'm pretty sure that's what that sign is showing us right here. Yep. So the way that the runaway truck ramps work, and hopefully you don't have to use this, but if you are not staying in your lower gears, if you're pushing on your brakes to slow you down, 
and potentially heating up those brakes and warping that so badly that they're not working anymore. That's what the runaway truck ramp is for. And you can see it's right in front of us. The concept with a runaway truck ramp is you're literally going to just drive it up. It has a really steep incline. So between the incline and then the really thick gravel kind of sand that you sink down into, it'll sink the vehicle so that you're able to come to a stop. And we've seen semis in here. I've seen it many times out throughout my childhood and stuff. In fact, if you look closely, you can see that there's impressions of tire tracks that probably were within the last day. So it's very common for trucks to be on this. I'm not sure I've really seen RVs on here. So let's try to keep it that way and not be an RV up on that ramp. But that's what the runaway truck ramps are like. And then of course you need to get a tow to pull you back out of there. That semi that just blew by us is going way too fast. <laughs> so um, we keep it in like second gear, sometimes third gear, and then only if it's really pushing the RPMs a little bit too hard, Jeremy doesn't feel comfortable being at that kind of RPM, then he'll push on the brakes and let it slow down the RV. But in general, he's not even pushing on the brakes other than once or twice, just a few general times to get it to be able to drop down to that lower gear if the RPMs are getting a little bit too high. And before I turn it over to Jeremy to give you some audio on the actual driving, I wanted to tell you about the traction law in Colorado. So this in, is in effect from September 1st through May 31st, so pretty much all winter and some of that shoulder season. It's on I-70 from the whole stretch from Morrison all the way till you're getting out of the state. And the issue is that you need to either have four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive, which we don't in a motorhome. You need to have snow or winter tires, which we don't also or you need to have all weather radiated tires, which we don't, or you need to have chains or an approved chain device. We actually carry with us something called auto socks. And we like those because the problem with chains, there's a few problems. They really damage up your wheel well if you're putting chains on your big RV tires. And the other issue is they're heavy and they can be a lot of money and you have to be able to store them. So we use something called auto socks. They are approved and something you can use at Utah as well. It's like a fabric cloth that you wrap around the tire, but it has that traction as well. So when you're going at really low speeds, which if in a snow blizzard, you're only going, you know, 10, 15 miles per hour, if anything, you can use those to help you along. So you need to be sure that you have chains if you're coming through Colorado or you have auto socks. And I'll link to those below so you can easily find how to buy those and get the appropriate ones for your sized vehicle. Now let's hear from Jeremy.
stop and buy stuff, this is a good place for that too. Here's where you can let it out now. This is, now you're down, you know, into the town, you can let it out. This lane ends now, so you gotta, you gotta get over, but, um, it's the Eisenhower Pass. I didn't, you know, there's nothing to be scared of with it. Uh, you know, I mean, you just have to downshift, that's it. You can't be in a rush. You know, you try to go 50, 60 miles an hour going downhill, that's where you're gonna get into trouble. Where you got a lot of speed, you're gonna come across, the set's gonna be fast, and then you're gonna be riding your brakes to try to stay up with your speed, and it's it's gonna be that's where you can get into trouble. And some of these truckers do it, especially out of state. They don't know about it, so they come into it fast. There's some people that are terrified of it, so they drive. 